All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's a little bit like being in politics. No one ever listens to you. Good morning, everybody. It's just fantastic to see you. What a wonderful group we have today, don't we? Yeah. I'm Keith Martin, the Executive Director of the Consortium of Universities for Global Health. And from all of us, it is absolutely wonderful to see you in person. We are no longer Zoom creatures. And to be able to renew old acquaintances and meet new ones. On behalf of our board of directors, our executive planning committee, uh, and all of those who made this happen, including our team uh, in Washington, D.C., a big thank you to all of you for making the trek here to Los Angeles to come to CUGH 2024. I'd like to particularly thank those of you who have come from afar, because we know that it's an enormous investment in time in effort and resources to do this. So your efforts to come here, I could tell you from the bottom of our hearts, we're extremely grateful. And indeed, we can't work and do our work without you. So I must tell you, this conference in Los Angeles was actually supposed to be in 2022. But if you remember, we canceled it because of COVID. We didn't think it was safe to actually run a big conference here at that time. So we canceled it. But we promised Los Angeles and our friends here in Los Angeles and the West Coast that we would come back. So we're back. We're back in Los Angeles. And when we created the theme for this conference, Global Health Without Borders, we thought it through and we thought how apt to have that particular theme. Because of all of us know that the challenges before us really require transnational efforts and efforts for us to collaborate to meet those challenges. So please look at this meeting as an invitation. It is in fact an invitation for us, and this is in fact our aspiration at CUGH, as you know, that we're able to work together, to collaborate, to build networks, to share knowledge, and ultimately be able to engage with each other and all the sectors out there, including government, NGOs and INGOs to improve the well-being of people on the planet. So our hope is that as you meet over the next three days, that you will be able to meet new people, share your knowledge, and please do ask the questions that are burning for you. What are those questions that you struggle with when you're back home? Share them, because I guarantee you others will have exactly the same problems ahead. Now today is a propitious moment, and Dr. Lickfield, our board chair, is going to tell you a little bit about that in a second. But none of this would happen without the efforts of many. So I'm going to just share with you uh, some of the members of the members of the Executive Planning Committee who made this happen, and they're going to come up and speak in the order. I'll introduce them, they'll speak after. So it's really, uh, I mean, it was a fun group to have, wasn't it? We actually had fun and, and uh, you know, at CUGH, we can't do it without our partners. So first, uh, Professor Sophia Gruskin, She's the director of the Institute of Inequalities in Global Health and is a lawyer. We want to get more lawyers in our world at the University of Southern California. And Professor Kerry Farquhar, uh, she is the chair of Global Health at the University of Washington. Kerry, thank you. And Mishka Sirius Cole, who has actually been with us for probably 10 years. And she's been the interlocutor with her team at the National Cancer Institute to build and create what has become their premier international Global Health Day. Thank you, Mishka. And Dr. George Rutherford, who uh, was going to be here with uh, uh, Jeremy Alberga from uh, the University of California, San Francisco, who both did an amazing job in being part of our, 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 our uh, conference. I also um, would like to thank Megan Golding, who is here, who has been part of that team. Now, none of this would happen, of course, without the amazing team that we have in Washington, D.C. And I'm going to introduce them, and they'll stand up so you know who they are. Uh, Dalal Najjar, our Deputy Director, Norma Verona, our Events and Membership Engagement Manager, Sarah McGee, our Senior Project Officer, Katie Douglas, our Administration Communications Coordinator, <laughs> Kareem, Kareem Jafriel, our Intern, 
Doris Steinbeck and Norm Stein, who have been with us from the beginning and make the stuff happen here. Doris and Norman. They're like part of the family, and they just don't know it yet. So uh, with that, it's uh, my great pleasure on behalf of all of us to uh, thank all of you again for being here. I will turn it over to our board chair, Professor Maureen Duckfield, uh, and she's going to uh, have a word with you and give the regards from our board of directors. Maureen. Wow, look around you, look at us. Uh, congratulations on being together through a lot of obstacles. There's a lot to celebrate, and I'm really humbled to celebrate with you. Obviously, celebrate our CEO, Dr. Keith Martin. And then I understand there is a slide for us to celebrate what, how I started my morning. At 3 a.m., our time, which is 6 a.m. on the East Coast, usually when I start my morning, I had three um, congratulations, congratulatory messages on WhatsApp from the Caribbean in Suriname telling me and congratulating me because it's International Women's Day. Yes! like all women to stand. Come on, let's go. You know, a few weeks ago, I was in St. Croix celebrating our 45th wedding anniversary. People here from the Virgin Islands. Anybody here from the Virgin Islands? We have to work on that. And so um, <laughs> I wanted to eat roti. And I know there are people here who know what roti is and fantastic curry doll. And there was this one little shop where you could get it. Now, I was there on the wrong day. We were there on the wrong day because they only had rotis on Friday and we were there on a Saturday. But in that little club, that little bar, there was a sign that I asked for the woman who was leading the, the whole area to make a copy. And if you have not seen the sign, remember it. It said, you don't know how strong women are. Women are like tea bags. You only know how strong they are when you put them in hot water. <laughs> Isn't that true? And so um, today I want to recognize a number of women, giants among us. The first giant is the leader who introduced me to be a mentor for global leaders. Please join me to rec uh, uh, recognize and congratulate the giant, Michelle Berry. Come on, Michelle. And then there is a giant among us um, that uh, in her own quiet way is going to re revolutionize and help us reimagine global health. Judy Wasserheit, please stand. <laughs> and then there is another giant around us, and I hope she's here, who never gave up so that we commit in 2027, we will have this meeting outside of the United States. Betty Garcia, where are you? And then there are even uh, giants that very quietly push those big rocks, rocks uphill to make things look so smoothly as you see them today. Um, the people who do the things that none of us think about or none of us can, magic, can, can manage in such a very special and dedicated way. 
Please join me in thanking Dalal Najjar. And then, because my five minutes are surely up, um, I visited a supporter uh, of, our, of our school uh, yesterday, and he shared with me, and actually he thanked me for modernizing our School of Public Health, and he said, you know, I've learned from a phrase which I want to share with you, and then I'll sit down. Um, and that phrase was, change is good, you go first. <laughs> and so, we are going first by sharing with you our commitment from the board for the 2027 meeting to happen internationally. We are first to begin to reimagine our membership. Thank you, Virginia Houghton. Jenny, are you here? There she is. <laughs> by working to make sure that we get LMIC, more LMIC partners into our midst. So, um, enjoy the day, enjoy the, the days, enjoy this week, enjoy the conference, and commit to growing emerging global leaders, and commit to supporting our organization. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Uh, happy International Women's Day again. Um, <laughs> I am, I'm so delighted to be part of this organizing committee and as the only EPC member based in Los Angeles to welcome you to Los Angeles and to this 2024 CUGH conference. It's been really an honor to support CUGH being hosted here and to work with Keith and the CUGH staff and the other EPC members to put together this conference over the last many months. And I'm really, really happy to see everybody in this room old friends, new friends, people I know, people I, I don't, people from close and far away, and people actually that I see every day, as well as people that I haven't seen since the pandemic. And that's amazing, and it's that sense of community that is really one of the wonderful byproducts of these types of gatherings and what this is all meant to be about. You know, Los Angeles is a great global city where great things happen. But as you know, and as I'm sure you're seeing, we also have our share of real problems. But as I'm sure you will also see, the engagement with global health in this global city is not just about what happens out there, but about what the connections are with the rest of the world and about how that connects to what happens right here. And you know, that really is what global health is all about. It is wonderful to be able to have you here, to be able to have you experience what's great about what Los Angeles has to offer. And I don't just mean our weather. Perhaps more importantly, it's the richness of the diversity of communities who call Los Angeles home. And just to give you one small but telling example, according to one statistic, there are more than 224 identified languages spoken in LA County alone. So when I first got here, I thought that that was amazing, but it really is key to the local global connections that make LA so unique. And this year's CUGH theme, Global Health Without Borders, Acting for Impact, resonates so much with what this city is all about. It's not only about moving beyond the very real borders that exist between states, but also about moving beyond the borders that we so often see between our disciplines, borders that make it harder to really do good global health in the ways we all know is needed. LA is a city that transcends borders in so many ways. And for this reason, LA is the perfect place to host CGH, CUGH. So I look forward to all that we will learn in, together in the coming days. I'm incredibly excited about the agenda, about the exciting plenaries and side sessions to come. And I hope that this 2024 CUGH conference will galvanize us, will motivate us, will give us the inspiration that we need even in this very complicated time in all of our communities, to be able to work together, and if you'll allow me, to ensure the rights, health, and well-being of all people everywhere in the world and without distinction. Thank you.
like to start by thanking the organizing committee who has done a tremendous job, really working tirelessly to pull this conference together, and also for inviting the University of Washington to be part of the Executive Planning Committee this year. The University of Washington has been a long-standing contributor to and also a beneficiary of CUGH. We played a key role in establishing CUGH in 2008, which is really quite a long time ago. That was shortly after the Department of Global Health at the University of Washington was formed. And four years later, a University of Washington faculty member who you just heard acknowledge, Dr. Judy Wasserheit, was chair of the first CUGH board. Since the beginning, our faculty, staff, students have learned tremendous amounts from participating in the annual CUGH conferences. And you know, we have openly shared the challenges we have faced, our successes, and our insights to help other programs also grow. So we're looking forward to doing this again today. Uh, we have a plenary panel discussion that focuses on actionable approaches to creating equitable partnerships. Partnerships that bridge high and lower resourced institutions. And we have a panel of inspirational global health leaders who will discuss sharing power, sharing other resources, sharing funding uh, with organizations outside the US. And as we engage in our academic pursuits, as we conduct the research, the practice, our educational programs that are so central to our institutions, we need to keep these things in mind. So please, please join us at 1.30 today. It'll be in the same room. Um, so in my last minute, I'd like to highlight two of the University of Washington's uh, unique academic programs. This is for the educators as well as the current and future students in the room. Um, these are uh, our DRGH, which is a doctorate in global health, which is a truly novel experiential learning program for early and mid-career professionals wanting to expand their global health leadership and practice skills. And also I'd like to highlight our PhD in implementation science and health metrics. This is one of a handful of doctoral programs globally that emphasizes implementation science, which is a methodology, as I think many of you are aware, that is of paramount importance in a world where there are tremendous no-do gaps. So if you want to learn more about these programs, as well as our master's in public health, our medical student, our resident postdoctoral fellow programs, our pathobiology program, which is also quite unique in how it bridges a lab-based uh, training with a public health and global health approach, um, please come visit our University of Washington table. We would be very excited to tell you more. I also hope that someday I'll see some of you in Seattle, perhaps when this conference moves north up the coast again. I learned that the first conference was held in Seattle, so I think it's time after 15 or 16 years. Um, or if you find another good reason to join our global health community in the Pacific Northwest. You're most welcome and enjoy the conference. Greetings, everyone. It's my honor to be with you here today on behalf of the Center for Global Health at the US National Cancer Institute. As a member of the CUGH Executive Planning Committee and in one of the sponsors of this year's conference. In that role, I had the pleasure of working with my fellow EPC colleagues in the CUGH team, like, and uh, who, much like us at the NCI Center for Global Health, work to ensure that research conducted anywhere benefits patients everywhere. We, along with our NIH colleagues, are longtime CUGH partners. In fact, as Keith noted, our now 12th annual symposium on global cancer research kicked off as one of the first ever CUGH satellite sessions back in 2013. For our center, connecting global cancer research and control stakeholders with the broader global health community has been a key priority for us and has been successful largely due to this close relationship with CUGH. 
I do want to make a big shout out to the CUGH team for all of their work to make this conference happen. Our work at the Center for Global Health supports the NCI's mission to improve cancer control worldwide. We do this by advancing cancer research and training, particularly in low and middle income countries, and coordinating NCI engagement in global cancer control. At the center of our work is a focus on trainees, early career investigators, and program implementers, both in low and middle income countries and those in high income countries with an interest to develop or participate in equitable collaborations globally. So I'd like to take a moment and ask those of you who consider yourselves early career investigators or trainees, no matter where in the world you call home, to please raise your hands so we get a sense of who the trainees are in the group. Excellent, thank you. I shouldn't have my hand up, but anyway. <laughs> Just demonstrating here. <laughs> and likewise, Thank you. I'd likewise, I'd like to now ask mentors in the room, whether formal or informally, that you consider yourself a mentor, to please raise your hands so now the trainees know who to go talk to. Fantastic. All right. <laughs> Excellent. We hope you will take advantage of all of the networking and learning opportunities the conference provides. Please also make sure to stop into the exhib exhibit hall. As Carrie mentioned, um, many partner organizations have tables there. NCI, the Fogarty International Center, other partners are all um, represented there. And many of us from across the National Institutes of Health are attending this conference and we're looking forward to talking with you. Before I close, I want to invite you to join us in this room tomorrow at 11 a.m for the plenary session on models of integrated people-centered health services to address non-communicable diseases in HIV care settings. This is convened in collaboration with NCI, the National Institute for Mental Health, and the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute for Child Health and Human Development. The session will highlight work led by our esteemed panel from Cameroon, Kenya, Mexico, Rwanda, and Zambia. And looking beyond CUGH, the 12th Annual Symposium on Global Cancer Research, which is convened in collaboration with CUGH and other partners, will take place virtually May 6th to the 9th. So this is the largest international meeting focused on cancer research and control globally. And you can learn more about it by visiting us in the exhibition hall. So enjoy the conference. A big round of applause again to our executive planning committee and our board chair. Um, well, as they leave the stage and I introduce uh, the introducer of our guest speaker, a couple of housekeeping matters. Um, again, first though, I neglected badly, our sponsors. Enormous thanks to all of you who were sponsors of this conference. We could not put it on without you. So a big thank you to Please download the app. It says it's called VFairs on your app. Uh, and you, there's a little QR code on the little booklet. We're going as environmentally conscious as possible. There's a big, large document you would get every year is now just a few pages long. Look at the QR code, and from the QR code, you can download the, uh, the VFairs app. So look for VFairs. And that'll have you all the information you need uh, about CUGH. And you can actually contact fellow attendees who are on there if they put their email there. So it's a good way to connect with folks who are here. Um, the restaurant, there are restaurants on there too. This, con this, this place is quite expensive for food, very expensive. So there are places in the area that are less expensive and good quality. So just take a look at that. The hotel's hating me for saying that, but that's what it is. <laughs> At nighttime, uh, be careful where you wander. There are some areas where you shouldn't go, particularly east of here. If you want to know and you want to go out for a night for a walk, please talk to the front desk and they will tell you where you should and you should not go. Come to the reception tonight. You're all welcome. And re please remember to attend tomorrow. We have our free Global Health Film Festival that we partnered with the Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting. These are amazing short documentaries. So 
They're free, bring a friend, and you'll really have an amazing experience. And you'll also meet the documentarians who made those. Um, finally, on the 10th, uh, at the end of the conference, there's a free uh, communications workshop where we bring in scientists and journalists with the Pulitzer Center, and they'll help you to learn how to communicate more effectively. And then also, don't forget to go to see the posters. We have almost 500 posters. The vendors, please go and see them because they're all ready and willing to go and share all of their work. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Mike Reed, who's going to introduce our guest speaker. So there's a little bit of a thing. So there's two stories about who is Mike Reed. So if I ask Dr. Gooseby, our speaker, who is Mike Reed, he will give you the honest and truthful answer that he's a man of great intellect, a great uh, ethics, a person who cares tremendously, exceptionally hardworking, and makes things happen. If you ask Dr. Reed, who am I, he will say, Mike, I'm the Lincoln lawyer. So, but that really does a huge injustice to who he is. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Mike Reed, the chief scientist of PEPFAR. Thanks, everybody. Uh, lovely to be here and, and really lovely to, to give an introduction to your plenary speaker today, uh, Ambassador Eric Gooseby. Um, for the last 10 years, I've had the privilege of, of, of working with and for Eric. Um, and for many of you who, who know him, have worked with him over the last uh, few decades, you'll agree that he is an exemplar of, of transformative global health leadership. But for those of you that don't, maybe I could share a little about our, our plenary speaker. Straight out of residency, Eric was instrumental in setting up the first HIV clinic in the world, in, in, in San Francisco and, and in the US. Um, and from there, he was invited to be the inaugural director of the Ryan White Care Program, moving to DC where he helped set up HIV programs across the US. In 2009, he was appointed by uh, President Obama to be the Global AIDS Coordinator um, and overseeing the PEPFAR program. <clears throat> and Eric's tenure at PEPFAR, um, I think many would agree, could be described as a, a, as a golden era in, in global health. He helped launch the NEPI and MEPI programs that were really transformative in, in, in catalyzing partnerships among uh, US and African academic institutions and, and led to mobilization of a, a, a health workforce to respond to the HIV epidemic. Um, he outlined a vision for uh, country ownership long before many others were thinking about decolonizing global health. And above all else, Eric oversaw uh, a scale up in HIV care programs that was, was unimaginable and unprecedented. By the time that he stepped down from his role at PEPFAR, millions of lives had been saved and, and millions more people were on life-saving antiretroviral treatment. After he left uh, Washington DC, he served as the UN Special Envoy for Tuberculosis, chairing the first ever high-level meeting at the UN on, on TB. And I think many people would agree that some of the ongoing global momentum around TB is a, is a reflection of that uh, global political action. Yet for those of you that don't know Eric or are new to global health, um, understanding Professor Gooseby's impact it really is, requires going beyond the list of achievements to, to, to appreciate a little bit more about his character traits. Um, and having worked with Eric for the last 10 years, I can tell you that his impact is a testament to a few key character traits. First of all, Eric is a leader with remarkable emotional intelligence. When Keith asked me to to give this presentation or introduction, I solicited input from many different people. And the one thing that everybody said is that Eric has a remarkable ability to remember the, the details of your life, whether it's a, your daughter's graduation, a sick pet, um, a difficult life transition, and speak with gentleness and affirmation into those details. Secondly, he's a leader who always has his eyes on the horizon. Uh, Keith alluded to the fact that I see myself as the Lincoln lawyer. I've sort of been Eric's fixer for the last few years. Um, I am constantly in the weeds whilst Eric has this uncanny ability to, to look at the, the future vision of where we need to go. 
And then thirdly, and I think the thing that I am most endeared to, and I'm sure some of my colleagues on the front row as well, is that Eric actually has remarkably little ego for somebody who's had such a transformative impact. Um, I'm not sure, but I suspect that Eric's lack of ego really is a reflection on his wife, Nancy, and her ability to, uh, to settle for no nonsense and level his ego. Um, nonetheless, I think the fact that Eric is such a great leader um, and, and such a, an example of what global health leadership should look like reflects the fact that he is consistently affable and approachable, affirming yet decisive, and inclusive and yet uncompromising. And so it gives me great pleasure to welcome Eric to the stage to do this year's uh, plenary. Well, that was really a wonderful uh, introduction, and uh, I thank my friend Mike for the uh, kindness in his words and uh, uh, his, um, his, his bravery in going forward with that uh, with, without any, any advertisement to me that he was going to. But I, uh, I'm deeply grateful for it, so thank you so much. I'm also uh, wonderfully uh, warmed by the faces and people that are in the crowd. Uh, it does make me feel old to think of, there are people here that go back into the 90s, uh, early 90s, mid 90s, late 90s, and then a large number who come in the early 2000s uh, that played a role, not in the domestic fight so much uh, for HIV, but when it became an international fight as the North-South inequities and disparities began to mobilize resources to move from north to south. So if I could have the first slide, I'm going to try to kind of give a salient uh, overview of where we've been and where we are, uh, thinking about the more practical aspects of it. But I hope to uh, kind of challenge us to think about what needs to change, what needs to stay the same, and what opportunities does this particular group of people convened in this room have an opportunity to achieve? Uh, the people who are here are mostly the people who are going to uh, take that next step, which I believe in global health is a critical step to realign program and resources uh, with population needs. We have gotten them too far out of touch with each other and no longer are motivated in, and I would say this in our domestic and international work, with the needs of a patient population as the reason we engage and defines the work that we do. If I could have the first slide. Uh, the, the advances that we've had have been unprecedented in uh, the HIV arena in particular, which I know best. The drop in incidence of children orphaned by AIDS is a wonderful contribution that keeps on giving to that individual child and the family and community around them. The prevalence of children orphaned, dropping pediatric infections in Lesotho, but also throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, dropping precipitously, and then pediatric deaths following behind. Those relationships, this community, this room knows intimately what it takes to identify a population, bring those who are in need of care into care and services, to keep them there for as long as it's needed, but also to be aware of their progression through their, is, their illness, their natural history, and having a delivery system that is aware of that and capable of responding to changes in anticipated trajectories. I think that uh, a delivery system needs to be the complementary piece to a population's ability to access and receive uh, the therapeutic interventions and diagnostic interventions that are benefiting from the science we already know. So if I could have the next slide. So HIV, the uh, breathtaking changes in HIV have been uh, mar largely done by the efforts in individual um, clinics and hospitals in country, but also in the mobilization that's occurred for those uh, areas of the globe that were disproportionately impacted by HIV. Uh, it's one of the few examples where it was acknowledged 
and there was a concerted effort to move resources toward those unmet needs. Built in um, a, uh, a situation where the drop in HIV infections, uh, we still have a continued influx of 1.3 million a year with close to 650,000 deaths. That continues to percolate. Tuberculosis has been this kind of pandemic neglected uh, really from the beginning, even with uh, um, an ability to diagnose and to treat effectively. We have not made available the drugs and diagnostics to the populations that are suffering from tuberculosis as frustrating as it, is, it has been. And I think that our uh, drop in tuberculosis that occurred with the COVID influx of uh, challenges to delivery systems, we see a little blip up in each one of the arenas that are looked at for tuberculosis. This is also matched with advances in the science of TB that are breathtaking that challenge us now to uh, make guidance available to those who uh, treat tuberculosis with advances in both prevention, but mostly our ability to effectively treat MDR and XDR TB. We have finally gotten there. The guidelines in WHO, in the US, in Europe, have all aligned with the advances, and now it's an implementation race. The malaria uh, outbreak uh, has stayed pretty much the same, although there are examples in 2000, 2020 and 2019 showing uh, that COVID did indeed impact in given, in given sites with an increase of unsprayed areas and increased incidence of infection. So the challenges and diminishing dollars are the juxtaposition that uh, we need to um, be aware of. The donor financing uh, moving uh, in the bilateral arena to flat, to below flat, really going back to the 2008 uh, recession uh, uh, that we had, uh, Europe really never came back from that. Our European capitals still are at, at uh, pre uh, uh, 2005 levels of support. In 2008, all of them took a vacation from uh, international uh, money that would go to program support, and none of them essentially have come back since then. People forget that. The 0.7 countries uh, do program, but the large bulk of support whittled down to continuation of individual uh, uh, clinic sites and uh, programs that targeted populations at high risk. The multilateral donor financing has uh, continued also to flatline and will only uh, stay that way or go co even further away. The discussions that are occurring in Europe and in the United States about the utility of multilateral uh, programs and a support uh, of a multilateral effort in general has dominated in many uh, democratic country capitals. And I think that the discourse has not been favorable to a shared responsibility, a uh, awareness of the fact that those uh, who benefit from the science that we already know are limited to those places that have access to medical delivery systems almost exclusively and to a lesser degree to pharmaceuticals and diagnostics, those who have access to manufacturing capability. I think COVID showed us in no uncertain terms that we are um, uh, not able to move our resources both in diagnostics and therapeutics when available to those areas of the country that have just as deserving a, uh, um, a need but have not entered a dialogue that results in, in those uh, specifics being brought into country and or sustained. So one-time deliveries, deliveries that stock out, deliveries that don't continue, et cetera, is much better if it's in a manufacturing, in a country that has a manufacturing capability and a primary care delivery system. So the other looming uh, her, uh, element on the horizon is that our sovereign nation debt is increasing uh, exponentially, even to above the level that the United States uh, 
uh, spiraling debt at you know close to two and a half trillion dollars. Uh, the money that was lost in COVID alone in LICs and LMICs exceeds uh, the trillion, the 2.5 trillion debt of the United States. Truly a remarkable uh, and I think serious problem. Shifting a little bit to a political kind of discussion, uh, the uh, political landscape with our uh, past president Trump's uh, running now for office, we see it uh, every day, uh, has uh, changed the dialogue again from a, uh, an awareness of having a multilateral role and responsibility, self-expectation, to one where that is no longer a priority or considered uh, a smart, wise investment. The discussion has shifted to why are you thinking about giving money and doing things in other countries in a way uh, that uh, does not, uh, quote, benefit the United States. The lack of vision seen that our ability to thrive in our environment is directly dependent on our ability to be in partnership with countries that are struggling with problems that we understand or more commonly have the resources to uh, mount an effective response to. The competing geopolitical priorities to not uh, dwell on this extraordinary moment we're in where we cannot seem to get to the day after the conflict discussion. And that is with everybody on at the table wanting to have, what do we do the day after uh, the, we all agree that the carnage is going to stop. And I think that the political ramifications of this in our United States alone has crescendoed in the last three weeks to six months uh, that in a way that we really cannot predict how um, this will really domino into multilateral international uh, self-expectation for the United States and European countries to continue to see their responsibility in the extraordinary unmet need as we move from north to south, but also as we move within each of our democratic countries, the inequities that are present in our own uh, neighborhoods uh, puts us in a indefensible position as health professionals to argue that we need to go abroad without having taken care of people in our own communities. This is in our developing countries as well as in our developed countries. And I think that call to conscience uh, that is, is kind of inferred by that is something that we need to reinvigorate in our own thinking. Uh, how can we continue to allow uh, medical decisions about who gets access to treatments or diagnostics dependent on insurance deliberations as to whether or not there is a reimbursement train that will allow that to be paid for as the dominant or sole criteria for accessing services and goods? Uh, our medical profession has allowed a managed care dominated um, uh, kind of machinery to be put in place without a discussion about the ethics of that decision or how that positions us for those in our own municipalities without or with less. How does that great to less move, but also it frames the discussion that we have for the international discussion as well in, in I think, all of our minors. If, as we move away from individuals taking uh, more and more of the resources available for fewer and fewer people to benefit from that, uh, that disparity and in illogic continues to get stuck in our throat as we talk about our responsibility in the international arena. So climate change and health as the new set of emerging health threats, and I've hardly talked about the pandemic, which has dominated our lives for the last four years, uh, is going to continue to uh, throw uh, threats out. And I believe that we are just around the corner from a continued uh, engagement with what the, the next new organism that figures out how to replicate and infect with a expanding uh, equator, uh, warming of the equator moving further and further north as 
uh, as we speak with the added uh, addition of the, warm, or the warming of the water in the North Atlantic uh, and moving down to um, uh, you know, the, the changing of uh, water levels all along the eastern seaboard. Those are going to have major repercussions for us in disease uh, choices that begin to propagate and show themselves and our ability to recognize and respond to them. So the academic medical global uh, health and crisis still uh, is in a situation where we use the term too white, too Western, and too male. I use it lovingly to say it this way. Uh, the idea is that our context in how we arrange our departments, how we uh, promote, and who we uh, put in positions of authority and power needs to open itself to be inclusive to our colleagues in country, in country settings that we have partnered with but have not embraced on an equal level. We need to take the next step to be collegial in both identification of resources to do studies, but also in uh, looking at once the studies are done, who analyzes the data, how it's analyzed, and how it's presented, needs to be an effort that tries specifically to highlight our colleagues who we're trying to mentor. They need to be put in a position to take the lead in a way that all of us have hesitated to do. And I appreciate the clap for that because this is all, this is something we all personally struggle with, but I, I encourage you to take the leap. There is a, uh, a landing that occurs in, pro in promoting your colleague to be the first author or the lead author or in, in, the, in the top three authors or the last author. Uh, when you have the discussions as to where you should be because of that, it gives us an understanding of the relative contributions that have been made. Thank you. Uh, but I do think that we are um, in a position where it's on us to change and we are hesitant to do it because we are not secure in our academic settings completely to take that leap. Thanks, Keith. Um, but I, I will say that the male-female issue is huge. Uh, it's in every institution we're in, and I believe we need to own that before we can effectively turn to uh, our colleagues in country and be the mentors that they want us to be and to mentor in the way that will effectively uh, mature the environments in countries. So. The male-female dominance that we see in doctor-nurse relationships and in doctor-doctor relationships is at least challenged and noted uh, because I believe we uh, will be able to save more lives in country if we change that uh, relationship of hierarchical to partnership. Um, it's, it's a difficult thing for... Doctor, the MD part of the partnership has been slow in seeing the um, inertia that is introduced in the system by a hesitant uh, professor, full professor, leading the research effort, research team, discussion about authorship, et cetera. I have been hesitant to get into these discussions, but in the last two years have moved into them uh, aggressively and have found that it was the right thing to do no matter what the outcome, I would say it that way. It's enriching to everyone to engage in, in it. The uh, challenges we are setting are too much uh, in the status quo. We're not willing to acknowledge that um, the inequities in the north-south relationship have persisted for uh, too long, and I think we are especially at a moment where the advances in HIV and in tuberculosis in both the prevention and TB application of long-acting uh, compounds. For HIV, we've got a two-month uh, injection that lasts for two months, needs to be uh, now developed to moving towards six months. If that proves to be the case, which there's optimism that it will, that will give us a tool that will, out of necessity, change our ability for latent TB, as well as for uh, multi-drug resistant and drug sensitive tuberculosis. HIV, in the same way, the persistent resistance that we see in developed settings 
uh, is not um, something that we have seen in the same number in resource in the Sub-Saharan Africa cohorts uh, for the development of resistance. But we think the inevitability of that uh, and a little bit more of a propensity in pediatric populations for HIV, for antiretroviral resistance to develop is uh, going to again be uh, 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 aided by a six month acting antiretroviral. The dialogue and pathway that needs to be created to allow these advances to be available to people where the burden of disease continues to reside, Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, and Eastern Europe for TB and HIV, we are in a position where those conversations need to be led in a multilateral way, but also in a bilateral way to understand uh, how we can position uh, the availability of these new products to uh, not come in at 10 years after the development in developed settings like they did for antiretrovirals. It was 1989, it was 1994, 1996 that they were widely available. Uh, and in Sub-Saharan Africa, it really didn't happen until 2005 that the numbers started to increase and continue to go up. That delay is unconscionable, and I'm committed, as I know all of us are, to trying to uh, engage in advanced prep work for the rollout of some of these new innovations, and I encourage all of you to see that as a given uh, 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 chapter in kind of the global health evolution with developed settings, supporting developing settings as the core model that we continue to use. We are still failing to address the challenges that are killing most of our patients with high blood pressure and tuberculosis, and that are, you know, your non-communicable diseases, hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery disease, must be part of our uh, medical response in every country we work in, but it is not primary care delivery systems are not what is built in all of the settings we work in. They are HIV, TB, reproductive health, exceptional centers of excellence, which have a role, but it's time for those centers of excellence to kind of pour out into a primary care context. So implementation occurs with primary care providers, expands in the primary care cohort, and not just creates a subspecialty uh, medical delivery system, which is what we're starting to create. Uh, I think the choice in the United States for primary care HIV dedicated clinic clinicians who only ran HIV dedicated clinics was a conscious decision in the Ryan White effort to not allow that to happen, but to make available to internal medicine, family practice, et cetera, uh, the expectation that the guidelines applied to them as well in moving new diagnostics and therapeutics out. And harmonizing that is something that I think we need to do both domestically and internationally. Um, I think the still failing to address these challenges of the lack of primary care platforms is something that I just want to leave in your head, that if we think about trying to save more lives as the primary goal that motivates us to get up and engage each day, we are going to save more lives with a platform that identifies the things that are killing patients early enough to treat and make a difference in the outcome. And our ability to find these people with hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery disease has to be prioritized in our, uh, in our uh, clinics that are dedicated to one disease type. The ability to take a blood pressure, a weight, and uh, a pulse is not uniformly done in most all of the settings we work in, but that data, if collected, can uh, you know, bring a continuity to the delivery system that actually ends up saving more of their patients' lives. So I really want to reinforce a primary care um, context. If I'm about to wrap it up. Uh, I, I, I'm afraid that if we don't uh, get uh, a different uh, con uh, context in what we think uh, as we reimagine global health, 
uh, and make it real where the outcomes make the differences that we see uh, are aligned with the needs that we that we've uh, that we find uh, we then are obligated to respond to those needs and I believe uh, trying to develop a system that better reflects the resource infusion that a Ryan White a CARE Act did domestically, but a PEPFAR did internationally. If those resources also focused on in, in developing a primary care platform in procurement distribution in laboratory alone, you would be able to complement a very sophisticated HIV dedicated delivery system that was only built for that can easily move into these other roles. And I, I think it's time that we do it. The government that is in that you are in is responsible to the populations and the people in a way that others are not. Uh, they, they have the charge to care for the population and keep them safe. It is, it is the uh, partnership that an external uh, individual coming in with resources and a program to a country needs that partnership to be rule, real. The government needs to take the primary ownership or it does not have the resilience or sustainability that we need for all of these programs to continue to deliver on day one and on year five uh, uh, to have the same outcome. I think that civil society uh, is the conscience of the delivery system. It is the uh, way that we uh, keep transparency uh, open, but it allows us and gives us an ability to hold uh, a mistake accountable, to see it and to hold uh, somebody and something uh, responsible for the fix. Without a strong civil society in partnership with kind of clinic and hospital delivery system management questions and decisions on how, uh, how resources are allocated, that civil society needs to be at the planning table and at the implementation table, not just uh, the kind of medical uh, hierarchy, community, intellect that is in country. It needs to be shared. And that drives the accountability and the human rights agenda. If we uh, don't engage the private sector, we will have missed a huge opportunity. Private sector largely does not want to engage with public sector systems. And we need to think about how to change that. But the partnership needs to be beneficial to the private sector more. Uh, this is a new area for all of us, but for me especially, how to make a private interest uh, benefit from a public-private partnership uh, is, hard, is hard to sustain after a couple of three years. You can start anything up, but to have that relationship continue into the future, uh, which is the goal, uh, is a whole different setup. Again, the civil society component makes that richer, more sustainable. The government context of ownership, that they're responsible for the, the compliments, but also for the fixes when problems are identified, that we help them do that, not play a gotcha game. And I think uh, that kind of a system, if our USG started to fund delivery systems that was open to strengthening the larger primary care delivery system, not solely, but in addition to, we will take better care of the patients that we've committed to who have HIV-related illness and TB by uh, having that, uh, that sustained uh, uh, commitment uh, open and on, on upfront as opposed to inferred or preferred. Uh, but I do think that uh, our private sector ability, uh, in India has been extraordinary with TB looking at their willingness to take it down a different road and have that be part of the public uh, health, uh, the, pu the out output of the public sector as well. Um, those shared um, uh, efforts are something that we need to expand in. So the uh, investing in social foundations, it really has been consistently, if I look at what investments have resulted in more sustained uh, delivery systems months, years, years after, it's those that uh, have d invested in institutions. So uh, it's not kind of giving money to government, but it's giving money to institutions such as CUGH in that context, but to uh, medical schools, 
uh, nursing schools that are able to take your resources, add them to their own, and amplify the output. Uh, building uh, to, to build resilient health systems, this is, I believe, the, uh, the, the kind of secret ingredient. And I think that the context that we have not learned how to use is seeing health and the issues that you as a donor country come in with a, uh, a country to uh, engage in a resource exchange. You um, have, because of years of investing in their population, a credibility with political leadership that will allow for a conversation to occur that perhaps is more directive in what the uh, uh, what, the, what they should do with their uh, health care uh, system, in your opinion, but a diplomatic discussion using uh, the ambassador role in PEPFAR, using the U.S. ambassador and country, bringing ambassadors from Europe who are there for global health and TB and HIV into the discussion in partnership uh, is just an added uh, buttress of support that you can put to it. President Obama and uh, President Clinton before him had a strong focus on soft power as what they really thought the United States should be an example of on the global scene, but ne neither one of them were able to completely uh, put that in front of their foreign, uh, foreign service activities in the way that they articulated and wanted to do. Hillary Clinton had the same vision, but it was not realized President Trump's vision pulled away from that in the internal discussion in the State Department and in the White House in a big way, and it never rekindled in, until uh, President Biden came in. And it's rekindled, but it does not have a place to grow and root, is the way I'd say it. Uh, they're stuck in a reauthorization discussion about uh, PEPFAR now, trying to reauthorize it for one year instead of five to try to do PEPFAR with a five-year, with a one-year budget doesn't work. Uh, and I think that uh, that fight uh, continues, but the White House is preoccupied with everything else uh, on their plate. And it's been very difficult to get them to see this as a high priority right now. But I think diplomacy is, global health diplomacy is underutilized and is something that needs to be part of the toolbox that we use and, and, and invoke when we're confronted with problems that aren't moving. Um, so I think that the move to more vertical programs in an integrated way that has a primary care basis, even in the sexual reproductive health programs especially, uh, are uh, uh, low-hanging fruit. And I think there are a lot of people who are beginning to see that the, uh, ex those existing platforms need to absolutely be used to expand into a more primary care, primary care service portfolio in each country that PEPFAR and other USG programs are in. AI, just to end with this, has huge potential for us in global health in thinking and looking at uh, asking questions that try to take existing databases and look at them differently, go across them differently, ask are there ways that we could expand the number of people seen in primary care settings or in HIV or TB clinics uh, with a different budgetary strategy, a different synergy and system discussion rollout in a delivery system in a given geography. Those kinds of reconsiderations of what we think we've already thought through is low-hanging fruit. I believe there will be big savings in cost with that kind of analysis, and it's going to be the politics that prevent uh, the resources to move across the political silo, the political uh, 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 silos that are created. And it's that d d global health diplomacy that will allow that discussion to occur. Uh, I believe the United States uh, wanted to lead in that role, still does, but has not got the kind of uh, sub the current support and thinking uh, is not there now in the current administration to do this, although they would if they could. But right now, I think it would be up to those outside of the system to bring that idea in. Um, the AI for uh, looking at new 
uh, therapeutics, diagnostics, all the roles that it plays in medicine, I think we can also grab and embrace as well. Uh, they're huge. Uh, they keep on uh, presenting uh, new uh, ways to kind of cut the cake. And I, I think that the uh, LMIC uh, benefit from this will continue to be defined and grow and grow. Um, I will uh, end this talk with uh, an open to questions if you'd like, or we could move on to other discussions, but I've covered a, uh, a planoply of issues that I think are what I think about uh, in kind of looking uh, how to break into where we're going and what we're trying to pull into the support stream as we move toward that new destination. It's changing, it's changed, and kind of the uh, touchstones in my world of global health diplomacy and looking at bilateral relationships, trying to be multilateral or, or just continue as bilateral. Uh, this is uh, all, I think, um, becoming uh, a, a scrambled egg moment, but I believe it is the group in the global health that has the vision to understand the uh, needs that are present that we need to pull these resource motors into aligning with. I believe the global health brains out there are the ones who are seeing that vision before those who are immersed in just domestic work in whatever country you're in. So it's time to be the leader now, to be the voice of reason, to be the person and entity in your discussions that articulates a vision that allows for new partnerships and movement within government, civil society, and trying to understand the private sector as well with a large uh, expectation put on uh, donor resources that it needs to continue and the opportunities to achieve more are in front of us. We need to continue it and continue to uh, prioritize that investment. I believe that President uh, Biden's interests uh, and an intent is to do just that, but is so preoccupied with survival right now, he hasn't poked his head up to, uh, to really engage it as much as, I know many of you are in varying conversations around that, but it has been uh, quite, a, quite a moment uh, in that uh, with, I think, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict just adding a context that has made it just that much more difficult. So I thank you for this, and uh, I'm happy to open to questions. Is, uh, thank you very much, Eric. Is Faith and Wagi here? Faith, Faith? Okay. Um, you can get the mics, please, for Dr. Oh, Faith, come on, this is fantastic. So. Um, we're going to have a bit of Q&A uh, with the audience, and we're extremely delighted to have uh, Faith and Wagi. Uh, Faith is the, rep the African representative for Intelf. She's also, shortly, she's going to be Dr. Nwagi, uh, and uh, she's on the AfterHealth. <laughs> she's on the AfterHealth Governing Council, and uh, Faith, please, you're going to lead the uh, questions. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you very much. I've got a seat. And if we could have the uh, mics for uh, Faith and for Dr. Goosby, please. And uh, Faith, over sure. to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Keith. And thank you, everyone, for coming today. Uh, Dr. Eric, thank you so much for that remarkable talk. I'm going to be your moderator for the session on the questions to Dr. Eric Goosby. If you're interested in asking any question, please line up behind the mic. I'll choose two people per mic, have Dr. Eric respond, and then we move to the next. That will be the order. Uh, but I have the privilege to take the first question to Eric, <laughs> since I'm here. Yeah, so Eric, um, you are very instrumental in the development of MEPI and NEPI. I'm a Ugandan, and back in the day, I'm really one of those people who are products of MEPI partnering with uh, institutions. This led to the development of AfriHealth. Now, um, in your speech, you stated we need to integrate 
lessons from the low and middle income countries to really see that we have an equilibrium when we are talking about global health, where we are sharing knowledge, both from low and middle income countries and high income countries. What role do you see AfriHealth playing in this, having been part of an initiative that later became AfriHealth? So the role of AfriHealth or CUG? AfriHealth. AfriHealth. Uh, to me, AfriHealth uh, represents an attempt to uh, take advantage of the medical expertise, talent, and in both education and in the cl clinical system development that is in Sub-Saharan Africa in particular that had not been um, uh, put in a situation where the expansion into being able to do research and mentored a young cadre of individuals who saw an academic future in their future uh, was part of the uh, attempt. Seeing the need for a layer of clinician educators in the teaching hospital settings in Sub-Saharan Africa was the real motivation of it and wanting to create a cadre of faculty that had an academic future, did implementation research and other types of research. Uh, that was supported by the institution, and we thought that there'd be an opportunity for USG resources to invest in that machinery to build it. Uh, the, um, uh, I would say that uh, a lot of the uh, re hope was realized in efforts that were done by individuals and individual institutions, and AfriHealth was an attempt to bring it up to a level of, a, uh, of an association that covered the continent uh, that was medical and nursing, but it moved, AfriHealth wanted to move into other health professionals. So it actually became more of a association of health professionals, but its main focus was nurses and physicians. So I do think it's the future, sorry. Thank you so much. And uh, we have the AfriHealth president here. Please feel free to interact with her so that we can be able to really create an equilibrium in global health. So I'll go with that mic, over to you. Okay, thank you. My name is Jessica Haberer. I'm from Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. And thank you, Eric, for a wonderful and inspirational talk, as always. My question is about efforts for localization of foreign investment um, that's being seen in, in many institutions, some high-income countries like USAID and others. And I think there's a lot of interest um, and a lot of work going into that, but it's moving slowly and meeting a lot of challenges. And I'm wondering if you could comment on how, how you would advise um, to bolster and improve those efforts. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jessica. Uh, I think that um, the, uh, our hesitation to step into a relationship with foreign institutions where U.S. dollar funding actually goes directly to that institution is still uh, not realized in most of the program relationships between USG and other countries. I think that that uh, uh, hesitation, we need to, uh, it, you know, take the step like we did in Rwanda. Rwanda met all of its uh, HIV goals in, um, in, in really in about 2012, and the next evolution of the Rwandan model was really to move into a primary care delivery system support with Ryan, with the uh, PEPFAR generated support systems that had been built with the PEPFAR dollars in Rwanda. And we did that with Harvard, uh, bringing uh, subspecialty training in because that's what the Rwandan Ministry of Health wanted and we worked with them to define what that was and not in a difficult way, was relatively easily partnered into really creating many fellowships that were two years long for uh, individuals to develop expertise in some of the subspecialties. Still going on. Yeah. Um, we will do two people if from one microphone, then two. Yes, over to you. Hello, thank you, Dr. Guzde, for a wonderful presentation. And I'm Dr. Barry. I'm a, 
a PhD student at the Global Health Sciences at UCSF. Um, I have a, a question that I want to ask you, Dr. Goosby, it's about health financing in most of the funding is coming from the global south, to the, from the global north to the global south. And, but there is this issue of mistrust between the global south, not, not, not usually don't trust the global south because of accountability or whatever. And like, so sometimes that causes the, the, the issue where they tend to develop or tend to control what the global south is doing rather than like allowing the global, the global south to define what they want to do or what they want for their country. So how do you think we should navigate those complexities? You know, that's a great question. It is a dilemma. Um, I think uh, that a commitment to a partnership is where it starts, but what that partnership looks like is informed by the partners and the need. And I think if you start the conversation on the need that you're trying to build a response to, it always makes a better product. So I would encourage that whatever the effort you're in is, it should start with the needs of the population you're trying to serve and go backward into what that uh, partnership now needs to look like to support that continuum of care and services. But define the continuum of care and services you're trying to change. Um, I, I do think that most settings do try to do that, but the partnership doesn't get into uh, usually budget discussion because both parties often feel that that isn't on the table. And what I would encourage is that we understand and answer why it isn't on the table in each partnership and look for an opportunity to change it. That will require creating peristatals. Uh, sometimes it will require, uh, uh, you know, giving money to an entity that you both can audit as the resources are drawn down. We did that in Rwanda at a very early, very early point, and there's never been a transgression. It can be done without much difficulty at all, but we don't do it as a USG or as a European nation coming in with a bilateral relationship. A lot of hesitation to do it. Thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah. Hi, uh, Quentin Eichbaum, Vanderbilt University. Um, I'm curious, we're a consortium of universities for global health. What your view is on where the role of universities in conflict situations, the degree to which we be, should be neutral mm -hmm. and conceive of ourselves as knowledge production facilities versus more proactively advocates and wow. even maybe soft diplomacy. Mm -hmm. That's a dilemma, but I'm That's curious what your views are. What a wonderful question. Uh, I don't have an answer just off the top uh, <laughs> to, to, to that, but I really resonate with the question and the need to have a response to that. Uh, I, I think that we forget the role we play as health professionals in the communities we're in. Uh, we should take the space and put an opinion out uh, in a loving, caring way, uh, in a responsible way that doesn't uh, increase risks as much as you can manage that, but you are part of the response, whether you like it or not, and getting in touch with what that role should be with you as a institution in a conflict setting uh, is probably product would probably be productive for you as the institution to talk amongst yourselves as to what should our role be and then a plan could come out of that as to how you do or don't interface with government or with leadership in country or with leadership outside of country and the ramifications that that creates for your institution they're all big ones and i don't have an answer to you Hello, thank you so much for your great presentation. My name is uh, Dr. Francisco Ramos Gomez. I'm the chair and professor here at UCLA on pediatric dentistry. In your framework of uh, reimagining and rethinking uh, on the future of global health, I was wondering where do you place uh, social determinants of health? Most of these diseases that you mentioned, including mental health and dental health as part of total health, have to do with behavioral changes. So where are behavioral interventions in your framework of the future? Um, they are um, the, the central toolbox that I think delivery systems need to pull from are, are, are essentially those and no others. They are part of the response and our ability to change 
uh, the uh, outcome in the patient population is going to be directly dependent on our ability to pull those levers, understand and pull those levers. Uh, the social determinants, to me, should define how you position yourself to look for opportunities in the population that you're responsible for to change for the better. When you have basic needs like water, when you have basic needs of housing insecurities, food insecurities, how do you deal to try to implement a system? You it, need to have community partnerships, you right? Do. And, you do. And participation as well. You can't, you can't implement the delivery system that you're talking about uh, without those being addressed. So you have to have a response that includes those in the front of it, and then you move through it. It doesn't stop with them, but moves through it. They become enablers. Thank you so much. My name is Hebret. I'm the global director for a project called uh, Core Group Partners Project. Uh, we work with a consortium of uh, international and local civil society organizations to empower and improve community-based services. And I'm really happy uh, that you mentioned the role of civil societies uh, in, in global health. And my question is, how can we be intentional to really support civil societies to play the role that we want to play? And what do you think is the role of uh, universities, like global universities, in terms of being intentional to supporting civil societies, including this forum? I'm not sure if there is any civil society that is invited into this forum to, to really be part of this, this program. Thank you. Yeah, great, great point, great point. Uh, I, I think that I know Keith would want that to be an open door to civil society uh, to be part of this discussion and should be, uh, and I think is, but uh, it's always a struggle to, to do that. Uh, the civil society uh, needs to be at the table, but also needs to be uh, paid to be at the table. For us to expect a volunteer relationship with civil society is crazy. But we do. We always do. But what I would say is that the thinkers of the program at its inception need to include a reimbursement strategy line that addresses those needs, at a minimum to come to meetings for discussions, th that type of thing. But I'm talking about a salaried position and a role in a liaison position for the effort to keep that, in that civil society input on board. All right, um, we are almost out of time. Um, I think I want to give an opportunity for the online uh, question that came in. Um, Dr. Eric, uh, many of these global health programs and innovations are donor funded. Now, when and much of the funding attribution has a time span ends, how do we work together with the funders and the implementers to create sustainability of these amazing projects that come out of this, but then the funding runs out over to you? Well, thank you. Um, I think the, uh, in the inception of the project, ideally, there should be discussion about startup, and once you reach a certain level of performance and outputs start happening, you're looking at those outcomes as reflective of your program. You need to be able to start a discussion about how do we sustain this when donor monies stop. A diversification of your funding portfolio is easy to say, but hard to create. But that's what you have to do on day one. You need to think about who are the local partners that understand this need, and how can I bring them into a higher awareness of what I'm doing in responding to that need, so they, at a minimum, see it as something that has benefited it. That, at a minimum, is where the discussion starts. Bring them in. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Eric. Our time is up, unfortunately, but I still see people lining up at the mic. Uh, please feel free to interact with him in the free sessions. And yeah, thank you so much for listening. And over to you, Keith, for the next lineup. It's lunch.
It's lunchtime. Faith, fantastic job. Thank you so much, Faith.